webinar by National Space Society, USA, Mumbai chapter on unraveling the dark universe. I hope you all are doing well. So let's start our today's webinar. NSS is an educational and nonprofit society dedicated to creating a spacefaring civilization. Here, Sorry. Here, we aim to spread awareness amongst space enthusiasts and students about space and SEEM and space and provide them with a platform to interact with experts and amongst themselves. So, as, uh, I would like to welcome our today's guest of honor, Dr. Satya Gonchu. Uh, Gonchu. Hello, ma'am. And um, I would like to present a video for her. Dr. Satya Goncho, uh, Goncho is a cosmologist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. After pursuing her undergraduate degrees in France, she earned a PhD from University of Barcelona, working on quasars and their spectra for cosmology purposes. She was involved in Bayern Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey from 2012 to 2017. She then joined Dark Energy Spectroscopic Survey DESI project from 2018. Uh, she, apart from this, uh, apart from her interest in intergalactic medium-based cosmology, she also serves, serves as a lead observing scientist for TC Project. Dr. Goncho Goncho is also an avid science communicator, and she is an experienced artist in Odishi dance. She has been awarded with Giuseppe Kiaka International Award for Astronomy and Meteorology in 20, 2019. And in the same year, she was also a recipient of Forbes 30 Under 30. She is also a mentor at Supernova Foundation Mentoring for Women in Physics, which is where I got to know about her and I got acquainted with her. And uh, I, as soon as I read her quote, your education, your take ownership of your own education. I instantly idolized her. So thank you and let's start our today's webinar. There are a few things I would like uh, you, I would like our audience to do. Uh, so there's this, uh, so uh, you can see a tab here, view. So ma'am will be sharing her screen. She will be presenting to us. And so uh, we would like you to keep her video to us uh, beside that uh, presentation uh, because she will be explaining us uh, that. And also you can ask your questions in the chat box and we will be glad to answer those after the end of the talk. So let's start our today's webinar. Hello, ma'am. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Uh, that was a very flattering presentation. That's very kind of you. Um, I would like to thank the National Space Society and the organizers, Supriyal, so Rutuku, Pratamesh, and Shubham, for extending uh, the invitation to talk about one of my absolute favorite subjects to talk about. And um, I would also like to thank all of you for making the time to join us today. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And let me know in case you cannot see it. Should be fine now. Um, yes, so my name is Satya Goncho Agoncho. I am an observational cosmologist at Lawrence uh, Berkeley Lab in California. And through this opportunity we have to exchange with each other today, I want to let, tell you about how we know what we know about our universe. And how do we go about mapping the universe, about piecing together its history? What can we, uh, you know, by going through this exercise, what does it teach us about 95% of the content of the universe, namely dark energy and dark matter, which I refer to in the title of this talk as dark universe. And finally, I also want to address questions such as, 
why do we have so many telescopes and satellites and why do we need them to look at the night sky? Um, as a classically trained scholar, my first instinct is always to start by paying careful attention to the words that we use. And so I would like to start with the etymology of the word cosmology. Uh, cosmology has cosmo from the, the Greek uh, cosmos, sorry, and that means world or orderly arrangement. And it's thought that Pythagoras is the first person to ever use that word to refer to the universe, the world that we live in. And then the other part of that, of that, um, of uh, cosmology is logia. And that means discourse, theory, the study of, the science of. And so it's a word forming element that refers to the concept of knowledge and understanding. And so with cosmology, we aim to understand the worlds that we live in. And that means answering questions such as, what is the universe made of? What is its past history? What will be its future? And what does that mean for our future? And as I men mentioned earlier, I am an observational cosmologist. And that means that the starting point of my investigation is to simply look up at the sky. Now, I grew up in urban areas and believe it or not, I had never experienced a very dark night sky full of stars until I was well into my 20s. And I saw the Milky Way with my own eyes for the first time when I was 27 years old, somewhere in the Atacama Desert of Chile. So I understand very well that being able to look up at a dark sky is a privilege. But if you're lucky enough to look up at the sky in one of Earth's dark sanctuary, that is a place preserved from the proximity of human activities and human artificial light, that's where you may be able to see with your very own eyes, you know, um, the Milky Way, for example. So I took this particular picture at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile a couple of years ago. And when you look at this, it's easy to imagine how such sites can ignite curiosity and thirst for understanding the world that we live in. So from what we know, civilizations past had an easier access to the dark sky, but a different, more primitive understanding of the laws of physics. Now, our civilization has made great strides in the 21st century um, to, with regards to the, the, the laws of physics. And so strong of that understanding uh, of other areas of physics, we diligently look at the sky, our past, and try to piece it together. The idea being that the better we understand the evolution of the universe up until now, the better we will be able to predict what is to come. So let us start by establishing our own place in the world. You can see on the left-hand side of the picture what looks like structure on the sky. It's our home, our home galaxy. It's the Milky Way. And we're sitting on the outskirts of our galaxy. And when we are looking out into the universe, we're seeing the main, main trunk of our galaxy. It's called the galactic plane. Now think about it as if you were standing and then looking at the ground right beneath you. And you would of course see the ground, but you will also see part of your torso and your legs and your feet. And it's kind of a blind spot, right? Just like when you're driving, it's a blind spot where you see part of yourself as well as what you wanna see that is the ground. And it's preventing you to look any further in that direction. Well, the Milky Way is actually going to act like that for us as well. So let's change our, our viewpoint. And what I'm showing you, this is a real astronomical image of a spiral galaxy, just like our Milky Way, our galaxy. Now, keep in mind, we haven't yet mastered intergalactic travel, so we cannot go out of our galaxy. We cannot even go outside of our solar system. So this isn't our galaxy, but one that looks very much like ours. And so we live on Earth. Earth is part of uh, a collection of planets orbiting around a star called the sun. That's the solar system. 
And our own galaxy, so it's that solar system is organized around one star, and our own galaxy holds 100,000 million stars, right? And our own galaxy is just one of many, many billions of galaxies in the universe. So everything we know, we know it from the point of view of standing, living here on Earth in our tiny, tiny little corner of the universe. This corner of the universe is where we developed our understanding of the laws of physics. And that brings us to a very important postulate that is essential for everything else I'm going to tell you today, is that we, as a scientific community, we assume that the laws of physics are the same everywhere in the universe, and that there is absolutely nothing special about our place in the universe. And so anything that we understand here, that works here in our corner, that will be applicable in the same way anywhere else. And so, by the way, this picture, um, as well as the very first one I showed you, um, I took it with what is called the dark energy camera, DECAM. And it's the most powerful optical camera in the world. So think of your iPhone only so much better. Now, what else can we photograph with the most powerful optical camera in the world? Well, this. If you look up at the sky and take a picture with that really good camera, it may look something like that. These are real data. And it's a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of a five-year effort that I took part in to take a picture, a huge picture of one third of the sky. It's the largest imaging map in existence. So yay us. And like I said, what you're seeing right here, this is real data. And um, the previous pictures that I've shown you where we zoomed in on galaxies, they're somewhere lost in there. And the dark energy spectroscopic instrument legacy surveys, so this effort of collecting all those maps, um, all of this is public, accessible by everyone. And if you click the URL at the bottom, you can also play with those data. Now, how do we go from such, you know, like a simple picture to dimensional image from being able to construct a three-dimensional map of the visible universe? How does that help us understand what happened in the universe several billion years ago? Well, one of the greatest difficulty and also accomplishment of astronomy, which is in a sense a cornerstone of our field, it's our ability to correctly measure distances of galaxies and other astronomical objects that we observe. We want to understand how far away they are from us. Now, let us understand how accurately measuring the distance is our key to understanding the universe, its fate, and the nature of what makes up the universe. So look at this image and say we can identify which galaxies are closest to us. Now they're circle in red. And then we decide to look at which galaxies are further away from us and then further away and then even further away. Now, just as a detective would be putting together clues collected in the right order and using perspective to extract information from its clues, we are able to use a 2D image of the sky and divide it into different slices of different depth to create a 3D reconstruction of that part of the sky. And so what, what is the, you know, like the red galaxies are closer to us and the ones that are more blue are the furthest away. There you have it, a 3D map. And so you have probably also heard that nothing can travel faster than light. And it's true, light travels very fast. But all the same, the speed of light is finite. And that means that by the time light from distant galaxies has traveled all the way to us, and we read the information carried by that light, the information is already outdated. And so the deeper we look, the longer, you, the, sorry, the younger the universe we're looking at. And now if we do that with many, many, many image all over the sky, we can do a very large 3D reconstruction. And the deeper we can see, 
the further back in time we can go and access information. And this 3D reconstruction contains information about the way our universe is ordered, its structure, but also its timeline, its chronology uh, of how things came to be the way they are. I'm just going to stop um, sharing for one second. And um, I want to, um, you know, sit with you and imagine another way to visualize that. Let's imagine that you are in the middle of a forest and all the trees closest to you are, you know, magnificent thousands of years old trees. And as you look deeper and further away from you, past those first trees, the trees are younger, only 500 years old, 200 years old, tens of years old. And then when you are looking as far as your eyes can see, it's not even a tree, it's just like a sprout, right? You, you can see that image. Well, it's the same thing. We're sitting here looking at the sky and the deeper and deeper we look, the younger the universe. So now that we have this mental picture, let's um, look at real data. Yes, okay. So over the past 20 years, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, SDSS, get used to that acronym, has achieved a tremendous endeavor of producing the largest 3D map of the universe ever created. And you will notice that I have used, and I will keep using, a lot of superlatives, like the largest ever created, the deepest. And it's not just because I'm very enthusiastic about what I'm telling you, because I am, but it's also because since the end of the last century, the rate of breakthrough and progresses in the field of cosmology is simply mind-blowing. We push boundaries and we keep on pushing them every single day. So let me play for you a video that shows a rendition of SDS's results. And by that, I mean, let's look at real um, images uh, of the real sky. What you're going to see here is our universe for real. So we start from our star, the sun, its place on the outskirt of the Milky Way, our galaxy. The Milky Way is, you know, one of billions of galaxies. And as we travel through that map, we can notice that galaxies are not equally spaced, equally distributed. There's a lot of empty space. Um, they tend to cluster together in some places and they follow what looks like a fairly random pattern. And so we go out and out and more out. And so you're going to notice that at the center of the reconstructed map, once we shift per perspective a little bit, there's something that looks like a bottleneck, a, a node, if you will. And that's where we are. That's, that's us. And the large dark patch that separates it are mostly regions obscured by the Milky Way. Like just like our legs are in the way when we look at the ground, that's what you're seeing here. So the 3D map shows the results of four exploratory phases of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It was created by focusing on different classes of galaxies, the nearby galaxies, red galaxies, um, galaxies that are also um, more distant, um, that are called star-forming galaxies. And finally, super luminous distant active galaxies called quasars, which are my favorite because they're my specialty at work. And this three-dimensional map is composed of one million galaxies, and we have used it to trace the large-scale structure of the universe up to a fraction of its horizon, represented here by the cosmic microwave background, um, which is uh, the emission seen here as a colorful pattern, yes, that's coming out in the background. And so the cosmic microwave background is a thermal relic of the universe, which dates back um, 4,000 million years after the birth of the universe, also known as the Big Bang. So it's a very fancy way to say the cosmic microwave background is the very first light that can be seen in the universe. Everything else before then is dark to us. So if you followed everything I've said up until here, you will notice that we have been focused, and this may sound you know, completely obvious, 
but we have been focused on looking at what our eyes can see, on looking at what emits light. And as it turns out, this represents only 5% of the entire content of our universe. So what about the remaining 95% of the universe? Well, that remaining 95%, it's called dark energy and dark matter. And once again here, I would like to draw your attention to the words we use. Because make no mistake, the use of the word dark, it's less reflective of what dark energy and dark matter are, and it is very revealing of our own understanding of their nature. So in Western Europe, the dark ages are used to refer to an era of history where the lack of pursuit of knowledge was notable. And since we know dark energy and dark matter by the effect on the visible universe, but we do not know anything about their nature. So because of that lack of insight into their nature, we refer to them as dark energy and dark matter because we don't have knowledge on them. And this cartoon that you can see here represents a chronology of the different epochs of the history of our universe. So moments after the Big Bang, the universe had expanded enough that light started to travel freely and it gave us the very first image of the universe, the cosmic microwave background. As the universe kept um, expanding, going from left to right on the image here, the first stars formed, then the first galaxies, and then larger structures made of millions of galaxies. However, these structures are not formed totally at random or uniformly. The backbone that informs how galaxies will be distributed, it's called dark matter. And dark matter, in a sense, it's the invisible skeleton behind the visible universe. That skeleton, it's also often referred to as um, the cosmic web. So what started in the early universe as quantum fluctuations right after the Big Bang grew to shape those massive substructures and structures um, with that have an, incre an incredible gravitational pull. So with dark matter being the heaviest type of matter in the universe, right, the most massive, that means that the atomic matter, the regular matter, is attracted to dark matter through gravity. And the same way that we are attracted to the Earth and are staying all the time in the neighborhood of, you know, of Earth, then regular matter tends to fall and settle where dark matter is. And that leads us to another key point of cosmology. We use what we can see to understand what we cannot see. And we use positions of galaxies that are basically light emitting units as clues of where dark matter is. From extensively looking at the maps we created, we have come to know about a primordial pattern that can repeatedly be found in the way dark matter is distributed and therefore in the way atomic matter is distributed. And this pattern is called the Baryon Acoustic Oscillation, BAO for short. And this BAO can be found at every single stage of the history of the universe. That's a circular pattern, right? You see the, those concentric set, uh, circles on all three of these images uh, that due to the fact that the universe is expanding, we notice the size of this, of this um, circle uh, being different at different moments in time in the universe. So 13.7 billion years ago, that's that tiny blue thing in the center of the colorful image at the left. And then... 5.5 billion years ago, it starts to be, you know, the shape that's highlighted in white. And then 3.8 billion years ago, it's just the same circle, just bigger. And um, B, the BAO pattern is used as a standard ruler. That means it's a reference of size, again, which we can compare other things. And now that we see that this primordial pattern, this standard ruler, is blown up following the fact that the universe is expanding. Just like if you drew a cartoon on a balloon, 
uh, and then you blew up in the balloon, you'd see that cartoon becoming bigger and bigger. Um, so not only is the universe expanding in recent times, but its expansion isn't slowed down by gravity, right? Because gravity pulls things together. So you would imagine that the friction that you would, you know, counteract this expansion and slow it down. But no, on the contrary, right now, the expansion of the universe is accelerating and things are pulled apart from each other faster and faster and faster as time goes on. And so where there is acceleration, you need a force to be responsible for this acceleration. And that's where dark energy comes in. So there you have it. Our universe is filled of atomic matter, meaning all the matter that we are made of that makes the stars, the galaxies, dark matter. That's the backbone of our universe and basically tells regular matter where to stand and dark energy that is the force responsible for counteracting gravity at very large scales and pushing large uh, structures made of atomic matter and dark matter further and further apart from one another. And the proportions of these three components, they actually vary through time. So right now, at this moment in time, the proportions are 4.9% of ordinary matter, 26.8% of dark matter, and a whooping 68.3% for dark energy. Um, oops. Yes, okay. So over the course of time, these proportions, though, they have not stayed the same. Shortly after the Big Bang, um, radiation was the dominating species at play in the universe. And that means that at the time, the universe was mainly filled with those particles called photons and neutrinos. And then after that came um, the matter dominated era. And that means that um, that's an era dominated by gravity, a force that pulls things closer together. And then, and therefore while the universe was still expanding, that expansion was slowed down. And finally, we enter the most recent era, the one that we're in right now, and that's the accelerated expansion era, dominated by dark energy. And we first realized that it was the case at the end of the 1990s, and it was unexpected and an exciting discovery, and that resulted in the Nobel Prize of Physics in 2011. And so at the beginning of the 2010s, we had essentially three pictures, right? Because if you, you are at a certain depth, just consider that a picture. So we had three pictures, one of the first lights, one towards the end of the matter dominated era, and one at the beginning of the dark energy dominated era. So how does that help us learn about what dark energy is? Well, um, theorists will come up with different hypotheses of what dark energy is. And these different theories of dark energy, they will predict different ways that the expansion of the universe can go. So let's say theory number one predicts this, that you know, the BAO pattern will be stretched that way and then that way and then that way. And then someone's like, no, 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 no. My theory, theory number two, says that you, the BAO pattern will grow in this way. And then a third person disagrees and proposes something else. Well, you can see that the biggest difference in all these predictions happens in the late universe towards the right, which is when dark energy became the dominant force in the universe because that's when it was the main content of the universe. So if we measure the size of that pattern at different moment in time, meaning uh, on those two pictures um, that we have, we are able to compare those real life measurements to predictions given to us um, by theorists. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen again. And, um, you know, let's take a step back uh, on everything that we've covered so far. All of us here, we are dark universe detectives and our goal, our mission is to understand our universe, its history, and its dark components. 
So we started our investigation by putting together our first clues. And it's also the most powerful clue. That's a three-dimensional map of the visible universe. We use 2D images and our know-how of measuring distances to create a 3D map of the universe. And by doing so, we also recreate a timeline of the evolution of the universe from right now, when the universe is of mature age, all the way to when the universe was young. So the primordial pattern that of dark matter is imprinted in the matter that we can see, namely in the way galaxies are distributed at large scale. And we can literally, you know, like take a ruler and we can measure the size of this pattern at different uh, depth in the map, which means that we measure the, um, the size at different epochs of the expanding history of the universe. And by looking at how much that pattern has been stretched at different moments in time, and then we go and we compare that to predictions from theories, um, we can rule out certain theories of dark energy or, you know, um, keep others for further investigation. And that's the beauty of the scientific process. It is self-correcting. And we've displayed great ingenuity, uh, ingenuity in applying our detective skills, putting clues together, extracting information. But now you may ask me, how come we do not already know what dark energy is? Well, a lot of that comes down to our level of technology. I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Um, give me one moment. App is an app. So um, to highlight how our level of technology influences the quality of the map that we build, let me simply walk you through the past 30 years, three zero. Now, I did not have the resources, the time, the permission to use real images that would work together for this seminar. Um, so forgive me about that. However, I will use images of something that's completely unrelated, but the good news is the principle applied is the same and the images are really pretty. Um, so you can recognize at the bottom of this image um, uh, the timeline, right? On your left, the universe is very young. And then on your right, the universe is like getting older and older. So let's start in 1992. And the satellite called the Cosmic Background Explorer, COBE, that was sent into space to take pictures of the very first light of our universe, the CMB. The technology at the time allowed for such a groundbreaking exploration, but we were limited to this like very sad, pictureized picture, so not very many details. And during the same decade, we had several ground-based telescopes measure the distances of galaxies in various pat patches and parts of the sky, and the effort was uncoordinated. So um, all pulled together, you know, our picture of the sky when the universe went from matter-dominated era to dark energy-dominated era was something that you can see on the, on the right. Now, if we move on to 2003 with the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP, it's another satellite that was, at the time, the state of the arts of what we knew what to do. We got a slightly better image of the CMB, as you can see here. Um, that was before, and that was in 2003, so improvement. And starting the year um, 2000, there was also now a coordinated ground-based effort to start to systematically measure the positions of the galaxies over the sky. And however, our technology didn't allow us to go very deep in the sky. We could only see the brightest objects, which often turned out to be the closest galaxies to us, which is why we're having um, pictures of the universe when it's already pretty old. And so we measure still the position and the depth of those galaxies. But because our instrument weren't too sensitive, it also took extremely long to make the measurement for just one galaxy. It's a little bit like, think of the 19th century, when you had to sit still for several seconds so that a photograph in a three-piece suit could take your portrait. 
Um, that's that's what we were doing with galaxies. So now measure the distance for a galaxy was time consuming, and we couldn't do that for many, very of them. So overall, the image is a little bit blurry, um, and it has the limitation of having part of the sky obscured by the galactic plane of the Milky Way. Nevertheless, as you can see, it is a tremendous improvement compared to what we had in the 1990s. And now we move on, and we're in the 2010s, and the Planck satellite, a very upgraded version of WMAP, gave us an incredible quality image of the very first, of what the universe looked like at first light. Now, in addition, phase three and four of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey have allowed us to look at galaxies that appear fainter to us. So if they appear fainter, that's mainly because they are a lot further away from us than the galaxies we would look at with phase one. And so we are able to have not one, but two pictures of the late universe at two different levels of depth. Now, you may also have noticed that compared to phase one, the images are slightly larger. And that's because the technology advancement allow us to measure the positions of galaxies a little bit faster. And so if before it took us a couple hours to measure the positions of say 10 galaxies, we are now in 2010 able to measure a thousand galaxies in a couple hours. So we can look at more of the sky. But let's get to the real good part, which is what we have started to do this decade. And I am immensely proud to be part of this project um, uh, that we, we use the dark energy spectroscopic instrument to measure the uh, position of not 1,000 galaxies in two hours, but instead uh, 5,000 galaxies in 20 minutes. So uh, on top of that, we can look at galaxies that are even more far away from us and that give us, using our example here, a depth of four images instead of two. And we are also taking images of an even bigger part of the sky um, than we did with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So if I summarize what the technological advancement of the past 30 years have brought and what we have to look forward to in the next decade, we went from the 90s, you know, um, that was a start, to the 2000s, improvement, to the 2010s, ah, we can see an additional image, a little bit more movement, an improvement, to the, what we're expecting to get in the in the 2020s. So like better resolution, a little bit more movement. We can see it's actually a dancer having fun at sunset. Okay, that's, that's great. And from the few images we've collected over the years, you see that actually in a sense what we've done, we've made GIFs, right? Little video of increasing quality. So now if you ask, you, you may ask, what if we were technologically able to look a lot deeper and take many, 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 many more high quality pictures, what would we get then? A lot of pictures. But you probably see where I want to go with that, right? We would get a high quality video. That high quality video allows us to see in that case uh, you know, the precise trajectory of the dancer and see that at the beginning she covers a lot of ground quickly and then her movements grow more subtle until she stills herself. It's neat. And so we went from a collection of images to a nice video. Now imagine what that means for our comprehension of the universe by consistently improving on the quality of the images that we can take. Uh, and on the number of galaxies that we can measure, we become increasingly capable of recreating a movie of what happened in the universe. That's neat. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing again for one second. And so by now, I hope that I have made it very clear that as observational cosmologists, we are diligently working towards providing you with a detailed, high quality, not even HD, not even 4K, but let's say 6K video of, the, of our universe, of the history of our universe. 
So if, or rather when, we eventually are able to make such a video, then surely we can make a very, very detailed comparison between predictions of the various explanation of dark energy and dark matter and then reality that we measure, right? So we'll be able to say, if dark matter is theory number three, then we should be seeing structures that look like this when the universe was younger. And if theory 34 of dark energy is correct, we should be the universe behaving like, you know, growing like this and this and that. And um, when it's fairly old. And so uh, here we're looking between whether there is an overlap between our predictions and reality. And so having a very precise and deep three-dimensional map of the universe, which is the equivalent of having a high-resolution video of the history of the universe, that will allow us to test and discriminate efficiently between different explanations on the nature of dark energy and dark matter. So if um, we are always working on improving our technology, and as cosmologists, we do this in order to improve on the quality of the 3D map that we are building of our universe. So the scientific process itself here, you can see that it's self-correcting, it's exciting, and it's the best way that we have to get to know the world that we live in. So now that I've given you an overview of what the field of observational cosmology is about, um, I want to use the remainder of my time to tell you more about the very, very exciting project that I'm a part of at the moment. Like I said, it's called the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, DESI for short. And since we've worked really hard on producing it, I'm actually going to share with you a very small um, little video explanation of what DESI is about. So if you give me one moment to actually up, use, and then... Up, Daisy begins, and you should be seeing the video now. But I need to play it. Yes. The universe is expanding faster and faster, widening the nearly empty space between galaxies. We know this is happening, but we don't know why. Scientists use the term dark energy to describe this accelerating expansion. It could be caused by a previously unknown force, or we may need to rethink the laws of gravity. Dark energy is a very big mystery, making up about 68% of the universe. To solve this mystery, scientists need better measurements of this expansion rate and how it has changed. DESI, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, installed on the male telescope at Kitt Peak National Observatory near Tucson, Arizona, will map 35 million galaxies in 3D by measuring their light. The range of colors or spectrum of their light will allow us to better gauge their distance and measure the rate at which they are moving away from us. This will give us new clues about dark energy. Light first reflects off of the telescope's 15-ton primary mirror then on to its six large lenses that ensure DESI maintains a wide, highly focused view of the sky, covering an area about 38 times larger than the full moon. These lenses are housed in a device that can be adjusted within millionths of a meter to preserve the alignment of those lenses. After passing through the set of lenses, the galaxy's light reaches fiber optic cables in DESI's focal plane at the top end of the telescope. 5,000 robotic positioners, each carrying a single optical fiber, are programmed to move to pre-selected sequences of galaxy targets. This automated dance of robots allows DESI to target sequences of thousands of galaxies at a time. The optical fibers, which serve as DESI's eyes, send the galaxy's light down the length of the telescope to 10 spectrographs. The spectrographs separate the light from each galaxy into a spectrum of colors. These spectra allow us to gauge the galaxy's distances from Earth. Objects that are moving away appear redder because their light gets stretched to longer wavelengths. This is called redshift. DESI's spectrographs are designed to precisely measure this redshift to pinpoint a galaxy's distance and how quickly it is moving away. 
Taking these measurements from millions of galaxies will provide a powerful 3D map. The map will tell us which dark energy explanations fit best and whether we need to rethink our understanding of the laws of nature. DESI will function like a time machine, allowing us to see the light of distant objects up to 12 billion years into the past. This new window into the universe could help unravel the mysteries of dark energy while teaching us more about the life cycle of galaxies and the cosmic web that connects them. All right, okay, so now let me share the rest of my presentation. Um, that's a lot of back and forth, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, as I've mentioned, uh, the, we spent the past um, five years collecting images that are of one third of the sky, and that's called imaging. Then we identified the galaxies. Sorry, I was missing that. Yes, so that's. On the right and uh, left hand side of your screen, um, we identify the galaxies that we want to follow up on. And we can, you know, sure, we can measure the distance from simple images like you've seen, but there is a method that is at least 10 times more precise called spectroscopy. And so the downside is that we need to know very, very, very well ahead of time where to point the spectrograph because we cannot see directly the light that we collect, right? So first, we spend our time mapping precisely the sky to know exactly where we want to point our spectrograph. And then we point the spectrograph and we collect these spectra. Um, and so the light that we collect will eventually look like that. And this, believe it or not, makes it so much easier to tell how far away um, from us a galaxy is. Uh, so now I just want to show you cool pictures to, you know, make it sync that we're already one foot in the future and in the next step of the breakthroughs of cosmology that we're going to have. So um, on the left, you see the male telescope where I spent a lot of my time in Arizona in Kipik. Um, and oops, sorry. And then on the right hand side, that's um, the, the telescope that's inside the dome right, where we installed our own instrument. You can install a regular camera, a very advanced camera, or a spectrograph. The telescope has a mirror, it collects the light, and then it sends it to whatever instrument you want to analyze the data. Um, so like it's been mentioned in the video, we use a, a series, a collection of six lenses to focus the light on, um, on, from the mirror. And the largest uh, lens is actually one meter in diameter. And all of these are assembled in a barrel. And while construction was ongoing and I was a postdoc at University College London, I got to visit part of the barrel while it was in construction. So you can see my size. Um, I'm not very tall at all. So this is, this is a big, a big, big, big chunk of instruments. And then on the right side, once it's been shipped from Europe, to Arizona, you can see, you know, uh, a, a more solid, bigger guy next to the barrel, and it still look huge, looks huge. So that gives you an idea of, of the size of it. And this is the director of DESI, Michael Levy, and he's staring into the one meter lens. So that also gives you, uh, but he's about my size. So that gives you, you know, just uh, an idea of how big things are. Then once um, all these lenses have been assembled. We actually didn't plug DESI. We plugged a regular camera to test whether the lenses that are supposed to focus the light, they've been aligned properly. And these are the images that we took. That's the ring nebula on the left. That's the whirlpool galaxy on the right. And these are gorgeous images. We can see the detail. We're in focus. That's great. So next step, we're going to plug in the spectrographs and um, the fibers that collect the light. So a fiber, oh, literally, you know, um, um, when you get internet and you have like, uh, 
they ask you, do you want, you know, satellite or fiber cable? Well, that's it. That's an optical fiber. It carries information. And we have 5,000 of them that are mounted on little robotic heads um, that will place them exactly at a given position. And all this has been installed on uh, one end of the telescope in the dome. And so on the picture on your lower right, they have been illuminated so we can see exactly where the fibers are placed. And it's, it's kind of poetic because you see they're divided into 10 petals that contain 500 fibers each. Now, um, this is under the room that has the dome and the telescope. There's a white room that houses the 10 spectrographs. And you can see in the background on the, on the right end, there's a, a man that's dressed with white coat, white mask, white cover hat. So whenever we need to go and work in that room, we need to gear up. Um, yes. And so zooming in, these spectrographs are absolutely state of the art. And I want to insist on that because we're a, an experiment that is starting right now. And usually it takes 10 years of planning to make another cosmological survey. And so even though we're starting DESI now, we're also planning the surveys that are going to start in 10 and 15 years. And in the design plans, we are planning to use the exact same spectrograph because they are so advanced, so state of the art. We know how to make them well, that there's no need to improve on that. That's, um, that's proof that it's, things are really well done. And so we have installed the lens that collect the light. We have installed the instrument that's going to, you know, um, make the finish and, and take the light for us. So now it's time to turn it on. And that actually happened on October 22nd, 2019. You can, I was there on that day and you can see us that was in the control room, making a meeting, planning beforehand, everyone stands. I'm like over there in the back. And then that's a few hours later, we turned on the instrument. We went on sky for the first time. Everything went smoothly. People are like a lot more relaxed and happy, but we had another eight hours of night sky to observe. So we, then we get we got back to work. And so um, here, I'm gonna show you an example of uh, the trajectory of the light. So this is the Andromeda galaxy. That's you know our neighbor, it's very close to us. That's why it appears so big. Um, and it's gonna not cover just one fiber, but actually probably half of the fibers that we have available. And so that's how the light is going to get collected and what it looks like when it hits the focal point, when it hits the DESI instrument. It covers, you know, um, you can see the hot spots. And then the light is going to travel all the way down the fibers. And if you look at the raw data, that's actually, this is the information that we're getting. And believe it or not, this is incredibly good information. We're very happy with that because we're able to transform it into this spectra. And I've made um, a little table for you. And for each of the lines, each of the spectra, um, I can tell you that, you know, on the first line, this spectra tells us about the universe, what happened in the universe 10.6 billion years ago. And then the following line tells us about what happened 5.9 billion years ago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now imagine that we are doing we're collecting information about all these different times in the universe, uh, 5,000 times over every 20 minutes. So that's pretty exciting. And I wanna drive the point home. Um, what's the difference between what we were able to do 10 years ago or even you know, just a couple years ago and what with DESI that has just started, we're able to do now. So um, you, know, you point the telescope at the sky, and then you want to put the fibers on the objects that you've identified that you want to collect the light. And what we did before is we had a metal plate for each part of the sky that we were drilling. And then someone would, let me click that, manually um, place the fibers in each of the holes of the metal plate. And here the video is accelerated because this process took about you know two hours um, and change. And so. Yeah, imagine doing that every night for five years, you know. Um, and now with DESI, the improvement is this. 
And now I'm, I'm not starting the video yet because I want you to understand this is in real time how we're going to reposition fibers to go on another part of the sky. Um, this is, by the way, a uh, at Berkeley Lab when the instrument was being built. So we're missing fibers. This is a test um, a part of the instrument. I'm clicking now and positioning. The little robot heads are moving the fiber around. And I think one more move. And then we're done. What used to take two hours now took less than a minute. That's, that's the type of improvement we're able to do in the span of 10 years. And so what that means in terms of observations is if in the early 2010s, right, if you're taking a slice of the map, we're able to multiply by 10 the number of galaxies measured. Um, so we fill the map uh, and, and we're able to fill in every blanks. And so if, you know, with SDSS, uh, everything that we've collected with SDSS in five years, now with DESI, we can collect the same in four and a half months. So we're gonna multiply by 10, the amount of, of data that we have at the very least. So I'm gonna stop here, but I just wanna leave you with a quote from my boss at Berkeley Lab. He's uh, the one of the scientific lead for DESI. He was uh, one of the scientific lead for SDSS. So he's been in the game for 20 years or, or more actually. And he knows very well what he's doing. And what he says is that for the past 13 years, we've had a simple model of how dark energy works. But the truth is we only have a little bit of data and we're just beginning to explore the times when dark energy turned on. So if there are surprises lurking out there, we, Desi, expect to find them. Um, and the last takeaway is really something that I, I wanna also point out is it's a collaborative effort. It's a collective effort on the part of very many different people, but also many different um, entities. And you know, good science requires collaboration and we go further by working together. And so thank you very much for your attention. And um, if we have time and we didn't go over too much, uh, I'll take questions now. Thank you very much, ma'am. Like from the starting point, when you started explaining the meaning of cosmology to the end quote, this, quote, this talk was so engaging that I don't think so anyone would have even shifted from their places. And so uh, now we would like to welcome questions from our audience side. So you can post those questions in the chat section so we can try to read those out uh, and we can answer those. If anyone would like to uh, ask questions, they can also raise their hand. And so maybe we can start. Okay, so here's one question. We are about how many theories are we going to test using this project? So um, we're prov basically we're providing a picture of reality and then we can literally anyone can come up with their theories and put it against the picture that we're showing. So, you know, as many people want to spend time devising a theory, as many theories we can test. Okay, um, there's someone who has raised hand. Oh, okay. so you can ask your question. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, are RIMS the basic structures of dark matter? Um, so actually, uh, so WIMPs are the weakly interactive massive particles. Um, yeah. That's a uh, postulate for what dark matter is. And um, if I'm not mistaken, they've been discarded as the main possible explanation for what dark matter is. Okay. Thank you. So here's a next question. Since dark matter causes, sorry, uh, since, since dark energy causes the expansion of the universe, then there might have been time in the matter dominant era, the universe might have slowed down. If it is so, will the light from that past affect the spectroscopic measurements? 
So um, even so, I want to be clear of the distinction of the distinction. Sorry, the universe has always been expanding, uh, but when we were in matter dominated, so we had a period. Sorry, right after Bing Bang of inflation, where the universe literally went pew and like expanded really fast. And then it didn't keep on expanding at that rate. It just slowed down. And it's like, it went like this. And then like this slowly, you know, it it slowed down. The, the, the rate of, ex, of acceleration slowed down. And so it was still expanding, but with difficulties. And now we're starting to see this because we're expanding faster and faster again. So, you know, the light is still going to get to us um, but, um, yeah, we, we're still getting, collecting the information the same way we would at other periods. Um, and that's really the distinction to understand about between an expansion that's decelerated and an expansion that's accelerated. The point is it's always expanding. Okay. So here we have one more, uh, so according to present time, someone has asked one question that how does observation work between Corona crisis? Oh, um, so actually, because um, we are on the land of the Tohono O'odham Nation, which is an indigenous nation of uh, the um, America territory, um, we had to abide by their rule. <laughs> Contrary to the American government, they were very, very cautious. And so we uh, could not operate the telescope for about six months. But we took advantage of this time um, to make a lot of improvements on the software, on the instruments. And uh, I will say I work with people that are absolutely amazing. And so a bunch of them, you know, literally went to the lab and brought the equipment home and literally built um, part of like test benches in their garage and kept working. And so we actually got a lot more work done than I would have ever imagined possible. And we were able to be allowed to go back uh, on site at Cape Peak National Observatory and restart the observations um, this past November 2020. And so now, and now we're in full observing mode. Um, I actually just came back from, you know, a couple of weeks at, uh, in Arizona to observe every night. So we're, we're working. Someone has raised hand. Okay. You can ask your question, Anirudh Malik. Hello. Sorry, I. So there's someone else who has also raised her hand. Chinmay Gade, you can ask your question. Oh, ma'am, how does the. Uh, I want to ask what is the major. Uh, how can we. Um, sorry, uh, yes, Anirudh Malik, you can. Ask your question first, sorry. Or if you cannot um, ask it because your connection is by, you can type it in the chat and I will answer it. Yes, please. Um, okay, uh, so. Hello? Uh, yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to ask your question now? I think we have some network Okay, issues. let's move on to the next person then. Yeah, uh, so here's one question. What is the difference between dark matter and antimatter? So um, antimatter is actually still regular matter, but um, with everything, it's okay. It's like when you take a picture and you completely inverse the contrast and you change all the colors and you just inverse everything. Well, antimatter is regular matter with all the intrinsic properties inversed. So when regular uh, regular matter and antimatter are which is are um, meeting together, they kind of you know just liberate energy and uh, annihilate each other. But both of them are what we call baryonic uh, matter. However, dark matter is not anything. It's not made out of baryons like what the stuff that makes up atoms. It's not made of that. It's made of, we have no idea, but the only thing we know about dark matter is that it's very, very heavy. And the only way that we can interact with it is through the force of gravity, right? 
it doesn't interact through electromagnetism, which is why we cannot see it. So here's one question. Is Einstein's mass energy relation also valid for dark matter and dark energy? Um, I think I touched on that in the beginning, and that's a good question, is that we literally, again, we the only thing we know about them is what we the effect that we see on the world. So the easiest point for us to work from is to assume that they still um, follow the same law, the same laws of physics. And so, for example, the the mass energy relation from you know Einstein that you're mentioning, that's one of the law, one of the principles of physics. And so we assume that it follows the same law. Okay, uh, so here's one question, Annie. Uh... There, is there any machine learning applications for DC? Oh, yes. Um, because we have such humongous amount of data and so many different angles and science and information to extract, and now we're in an era where we use a lot of machine learning in what we do. So, you know, if you're a student in physics or in math, but also in machine learning, you can find your place in astronomy for sure. Uh, so here's one question. Oh. Also, I see Dr. Jitendra Kumar has his or her hand raised if you want to ask your question. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, yeah. uh, Dr. Jitendra Kumar, you can ask your question. Or not. He has raised his hand. Let's move on to the next question. How does the discovery of gravitational waves further help in the investigation of the universe? So everything that I've talked about in this, in this presentation is about using our eyes to investigate the universe. Um, but it's actually quite limited because, you know, as human beings, we have five senses. And gravitational waves is actually using our ears to investigate the universe. So it's a whole other, you know, not even window, but door, or like we're literally breaking a wall on the side that we're kicking open into having new ways to learn about the universe. So it's very, very relevant and it's going to bring in a lot of new information. Dr. Jitendra Kumar is ready to ask this question. Dr. Jitendra Kumar is ready to ask this question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm listening. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is that uh, uh, whether uh, any kind of uh, elements uh, are named for the dark matter, just like we are studying simply hydrogen, helium for the simple matter. Then, So um, once we know what dark matter is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure there's like 100 people waiting to find clever names to name it. But for now, because we actually know nothing about the nature, the, the nature of dark matter, we only have theories. Um, we have different theories that are, I don't know, placeholder names for what dark, dark matter could be. Just like uh, someone mentioned WIMPs, like weakly interactive massive particles. Um, that was a name of a possible candidate for dark matter. So we have names for candidates right now, but until we actually know that it is dark matter, um, it's it, the, the only name that we have for what we actually know is dark matter is dark matter, which means we understand nothing about what that matter is. <laughs> okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, uh, so we have next question. So how far have we came to actually detect dark matter and dark energy? So detecting them, we're doing that, right? We are indirectly detecting their effect. Um, for dark matter, we also have um, experiments that are looking to detecting them directly, meaning interacting with them. So the detection in itself, in, which is a proof of existence, we have that. What we do not have is an, an, an understanding of the intrinsic property of the nature of what it is. Um, so is there any scope for chemistry students in DESI? 
Um, I will say probably for sure not in domain science. However, and and domain science being how can we learn about dark energy? But there we are actually collecting a plethora of useful data. And some of that data can be used not for cosmology, meaning, you know, not for understanding the history of the universe, but more for understanding specific astrophysical processes. And I will say, especially with um, quasars um, that allow us to look at the gas in between galaxies and the processes in the gas, that's all tied to the chemistry. So in that, in these type of um, aspects of the project, I'm sure a chemistry student could find something interesting to do for sure. Um, so what are two or three leading theories for dark energy? What do they say about what dark energy might be? So um, one of the theory of dark energy is actually that, um, you know, in the 16th century, we had Newton's law and that was our understanding of gravity. And then Einstein rolled in in the 1900s and say, hey, like your understanding of mechanics is great, but I'm going to add a layer to it. So what was true before was still true, but now we just had expanded it. And uh, one theory is that, well, Einstein's theory of gravity is great, but actually needs a little bit of tweaking. And so one explanation of what dark energy could be is tweaking um, Einstein's theory of, of relativity. And then, um, so that's that's one of the most popular one. And then there, there are many, many others um, on top of that. But the one that people are most excited about, you know, um, confirming or not, it's, it's this, which is called, by the way, modified gravity. Okay, uh, so uh, shall we, con uh, we have one more question. Do additive nature of charge applicable with antimatter and matter? Um, actually, um, yes and no, in the sense that mat if matter, if matter is uh, like, electrons is regular matter, right? That we're used to, that we're made of. And that's negatively charged. And then an anti-electron is going to be positively charged, which, which means that when an, anti, when an electron and an anti-electron come, negative and positive, they make something neutral. So there's one more question. Uh, is existence of dark matter so true that we can study the history and past of the universe? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, is existence of dark matter so true that we can study the history and past of the universe through it? Um, well, yes, and I think it's important to understand that we we're, we're not starting from the fact like, hey, I have those this thing called dark matter, and I have this thing called sorry called um, dark energy, and then let me see how that fits in the universe. What I really want you to understand is we're going from things that we're seeing and just, you know, um, when cars were invented or planes, they didn't exist before or it wasn't in our, you know, in our mind. And so we had to come up with new words for it. And what we're doing is we're looking at the universe and now we're, we're faced with those new concepts that we do not have words for. And so we try to the best of our ability to vocalize those concepts and so and and to understand you know narrow down what they are and so the exist their existence is not so much in a, it's not a doubt right it's just us trying to wrap our mind around exactly what causes what we see and so we are seeing very definite structures in the way that you, it's, it's not a homogeneous soup. It has, you know, clumps of where galaxies are together and it follows a pattern where you have filaments, where you have sheets and it's, it's literally like a skeleton. And that same skeleton is getting more and more defined as the universe gets older and also um, is consistent from you know one age to the other it doesn't change without making sense it's like a real trajectory and so that's how that's how we understand that you know there's something going on here there's a, a structure that we cannot see that explains the behavior that we can see oh so shall we take a few more questions or 
Um, I'll take I'll take one more question. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, modify like having a change in our understanding of of gravity that would explain. Um, why the universe is accelerating faster and actually that would relate to the nature of dark energy. Um, changing the laws of gravity, that's not something that will change our theories or, or have a great impact on our theories of dark matter. Uh, so thank you so much for this session, ma'am. Uh, we have our president present here. Akshat Mohite uh, of National Space Society Mumbai chapter. So I would like to ask, I would like to ask him to give a vote of thanks for this great, amazing webinar by you. Sorry. No problem. Just a second. Well, um, I'm going to use this to uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Um, and I hope that uh, you were able to get something of value from that uh, opportunity. That was a great day. I'm sorry, what? Sorry. Um, I, 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 Yeah. Um, hello, am I audible? Yes. yes. Yeah, perfect. So, yeah, I'm Akshat Moite, President for National Space Society and also the Scientist Astronaut Candidate for Project POS NASA. I would like to, you know, really thank you, uh, Mr. Tegonshu, for this amazing, amazing webinar on dark energy and the Desi findings of the unknown universe. And, you know, I am really grateful that... Uh, you know, grateful to have you on our platform contributing to sharing knowledge with others via the webinars we arrange. And yeah, just thank you so much. And I hope it was a really knowledgeable webinar and everyone, every participant here gained something. And any more questions, if you guys have anything, you can join the Mighty Networks channel and, you know, we can answer it over there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, so here's one more thing. Uh, so some people have asked us if this talk will be available. So you can go to our YouTube channel, National Space Society, USA Mumbai, and you can find this recording within one week of time of this webinar. So thank you everyone for joining us for today's amazing webinar on Unraveling the Dark Universe. I hope you can join us for next webinar, next coming up webinars of our society, National Space Society. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening and day, everyone. Bye. Okay. Um, bye.